Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Mark Lee. I'm a consultant in palliative care based in Sunderland in the northeast, northeast of England. And I've been asked today to come and talk to you about uh, the UK's experience in dealing with COVID-19, what I've subtitled the tale of three ways. Now, this is the structure that I'm planning to take. It is um, a narrative approach looking at what has happened in the UK chronologically and trying to uh, look at some of our palliative care approaches and how it has affected uh, us and society. Uh, I don't present this as a, as a list of rights and wrongs. There are plenty of critics in the UK around this approach, but um, uh, yeah, this will hopefully give you something to think about and chew on in the context of the day that you're having at the moment. Here we have a graph of those three waves. Um, the top uh, picture is the number of cases, and the bottom picture there is the number of hospitalizations. What we can see that in that first wave, uh, there was selective testing of people in the top graph, but there were, uh, there were lots of cases that were hospitalized. In the second uh, peak, we can see uh, that there is the number of cases matches the number of hospitalizations. And in the third wave, what we can see is that the number of cases is higher, but the number of hospitalizations in, is lower. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. If we compare those, that similar graph with the top graph being the cases and the bottom one being the number of deaths, we can see that there are differences between the waves again, with the selective testing and number of deaths in phase one, with the matching number of cases and deaths in terms of shape of graph in two, and in third wave, where we have vaccinations in place, the number of cases and the dramatic decrease in the number of deaths. It's worth saying that at the peak of the, uh, the pandemic in the second wave, that roughly that up to about half of the hospital beds in the UK were occupied by COVID cases. In the Lancet editorial, uh, it was pointed out that some doctors short of resources might have to decide who can receive critical care and who cannot. For patients who won't survive, high quality palliative care needs to be provided at least. But COVID makes this more difficult. Time is short when patients deteriorate quickly health uh, professionals are overworked, isolation is mandated, and families are advised not to touch or even be in the same room as loved ones. I think this is a really silly quote and perhaps captures uh, at, at the start of the pandemic some of the nervousness that we all felt about what was coming. Uh, we didn't know really what the wave was going to look like, but we thought it might be big, and we certainly hadn't really got a head round in palliative care what our approach should be. The first case in uh, Britain uh, was uh, recorded from two Chinese nationals who'd flown in from Wuhan. Uh, they were uh, uh, picked up in York in the north uh, of England and transferred to Newcastle. And that made big news in this country. The first UK death, however, was reported to be Peter Atwood, an 84 year old gentleman. Interestingly, he was found to, found to have had COVID seven months later after he died and after they looked at the case again. So it's likely that these Chinese nationals were not the first cases in Britain at that time. And really the situation at that time, as I've said, could be characterized by uncertainty, fear uh, within the public and within medicine. We were asking ourselves what's coming and we've prepared ourselves by trying to empty the hospitals to create the beds for the waves that we thought was gonna come. There was the rapidity of change of the condition that had been noted from other areas like Italy. Uh, and there was this mismatch between symptoms of breathlessness and oxygen saturations. And uh, this really threw people. The other problem, of course, was who to treat, given the resource issues, how to treat, what were the optimal treatments to give, and where to treat. And certainly, uh, these were uh, things that people had to wrestle with. Do we take certain patients to ITU or not? And again, there was the sobering group of young patients who came in and died. So I saw 25 year olds and others die of, um, uh, of COVID. In Britain, the public health response was to lock down on March the 23rd. There was an order to stay at home. And then in May the 10th, two months later or so, there was a phased return to work and then a phased reopening of schools in June. 
in the, on the 3rd of August, we had Eat Out to Help Out, which was um, uh, trying to get the businesses up and running. And uh, there were lots of different offers on. The wisdom of that, looking back, is uh, in, uh, in debate. As I highlighted at the start, however, the difference between the two graphs on this slide show that in the first wave, there was selected testing. Um, and the number of, that's why there was this mismatch between the number of cases isolated and the number of um, uh, admissions to hospital. My first case um, was a 62 year old lady uh, and I was called by the respiratory consultant because the lady was very unsettled. And they'd really tried hard to settle this lady using IV midazolam uh, in different doses. Um, and they'd even started a driver. Um, and the consultant just said, she, essentially, she was braying like a donkey. And, and I arrived at the room and you could hear the noise outside. And the family were all in there leaning over the bed. I have to confess to having some trepidation with this uh, lady uh, because of not knowing the infectivity or what COVID might do. Um, but in discussion with the family, I did what I would normally do. And I decided to use a, a more rapid method to try and help this lady settle. So after following the regime of five milligram doses IV of midazolam, she started to settle in about 20 minutes. So I left the plan of a midazolam driver, given all the midazolam she'd had, some second line levomipromazine, uh, and then some midazolam. And those are the times in which she got. And the patient died um, uh, after that, but uh, not fully settled. And I reflected on this case and I said to my colleagues, if this is what COVID deaths are like, we are not prepared for what is coming. Now, fortunately, this was the, the worst case that I saw in terms of symptom control, but it was a sobering and a reality check for what we might be facing. In terms of what we as a specialist hospital palliative care team did in Sunderland, um, we found that our number of routine hospital referrals dropped dramatically. Uh, but we ourselves decided to take a, pro a proactive approach by going around the COVID wards twice per day, uh, learning with the staff, supporting the staff, family and patients, and drafting some guidance. We found ourselves becoming involved in uh, symptom control of removal of CPAP in those people who had been put on CPAP and were failing. So we helped the teams out with that. This is just a, a busy slide that gives you an idea of the symptom control measures that we were uh, we were guiding teams to cover and how to contact for help. This was very much uh, a reassurance to say uh, that standard doses, despite my first case, that standard doses of medications would suffice in the majority of cases to control symptoms in people who were um, uh, dying or otherwise of COVID. We also uh, drew up some guidelines for ourselves uh, around CPAP withdrawal. These were based on some of the other things that we see, say, in motor neuron disease. Uh, and a lot of the emphasis of this document was not on the drugs being given, but on the preparation uh, of the families and staff. And this was a tricky one because uh, a number of staff uh, felt uncomfortable ethically uh, with the thought of removing these masks. And that was a cause of um, stress uh, and trouble. So we had to uh, learn to manage that. We did a retrospective analysis in the region of, of how the first wave looked in the hospitals. And we looked over five centres in the northeast, and, and this is unpublished data that we, we, did, we put out. And of the 434 cases, we found that over 80% were over 70, most were male. And as is the way in the Northeast, 96% were white British. Um, there were things that we could have done better. Uh, and there was a lot of stress and worry and, and understandably so about families being able to come in and see their loved ones as they were dying. But there was good evidence of family support given um, in 70 to 76% of cases. And in around 30% of those, it was given face to face. Um, 47% of families had contact with the, with the, with the loved ones uh, 
uh, in the last 24 hours of life. Um, 79% of those or 80% of those were face-to-face -face and 20% were video calls. Uh, these numbers were slightly different in different environments. We had to develop some new ways of working in the broader community uh, sectors of specialist palliative care. We noticed that in the hospice setting that there was a reduced number of referrals for the inpatient unit, uh, precipitously so. Sometimes we dropped in our 14-bedded unit to uh, three, four beds. It was unheard of really in my experience of 15 years of working with somebody. We started to take up regular COVID swabs with uh, both staff and patients. And we had to design uh, restricted uh, and graded visits. Uh, we were blessed, however, because um, we have 14 single rooms, which all have outside doors, which allowed us to uh, be a bit more protective and not have families walking through the building. From the community point of view, there was a reduced number of referrals. People were very much more afraid to come out of their houses. Um, so face-to-face -face visits were also cut down and there was an increase in telephone reviews. Day unit, which is what we provide, was cancelled. Essentially, no one really wanted to come and there was not a safe way which, in which we could run that. And outpatients became telephone reviews. Um, and our out-of-hours team had reduced visiting as well. We had an evaluation again. This is unpublished data from the Northeast. Again, this was from the first wave, uh, where we looked at five hospices and two uh, palliative care units. The palliative care units are just wards or more specialised units more directly involved in hospitals. They function essentially like hospices, uh, but they are much more integrated to the hospital. What we found is, uh, despite the large number of cases in the Northeast, that only 45 cases uh, actually came to the hospices. And that probably in some way reflects the rapidity of changing the disease and that this is largely a decline that is managed in the acute sector. Most of the infections we found were contracted outside the unit and the reasons for admission are shown there, but 56% of them were for symptom control and 22% of people overall were discharged. The most common symptoms were pain, uh, agitation and breathlessness and many patients had three or more comorbidities, hence why they were moving down a more conservative management route. Many of them had cancers uh, and one in five required uh, high flow oxygen. What we did notice that is that we were able to offer uh, better visiting uh, in the last 24 hours because of the layout of the hospitals. But the reasons for people not visiting was either due to the fact that they, the relatives themselves were shielding or there were concerns about visiting. From the family. Care homes was another thing that we found we, we really struggled with and this was a retrospective review uh, that was done um, uh, looking at the first wave, the first 23 weeks of the pandemic in England and what they noticed was, what they have pointed out very helpfully, that in the UK there are about 450,000 beds uh, which is double the amount that are in the NHS, uh, 450,000 beds which are nursing home beds. And what they found was that um, uh, there was a, the excess deaths have been estimated at over 29,000 or 6.5% of nursing home population. And this was more common in nursing homes where patients live than residential homes where the patients are more independent. Generally, they are a better, uh, uh, a better or more healthy group of patients. And 65% uh, of those were confirmed to have COVID. The risk factors seem to be that if you had dementia or were older or were in a larger home, you were more likely to be infected by COVID. I myself visited one care home of 40 patients and I had to see one of my patients uh, with PSP. And the nurse there told me that they had lost 19 of their 40 patients in the previous few months, which uh, was just staggering, really. In terms of evidence and guidance that was coming out, there was very little in fact. And so as a specialist palliative care team, we were kind of learning as everyone else was uh, about how to respond to this using the principles that we had. So when Ruth Ting and her uh, the team at the, at the King's College London produced this paper, uh, they very much chimed with our experience that the most common symptoms in COVID were breathlessness and standard doses of opiate in, a, in the long release form were um, were best to be used. Um, 
that oxygen should be used for breathlessness and not just to treat the numbers of low saturation. And um, agitation and delirium were treated with standard measures. They also, in that article, which uh, I've referenced there, had some tips on communication skills and phrases that might be useful. And I'll the wee list at the bottom there. Um, and I'll show you the references all at the end. As we went through the, the first wave, there was a lot of emerging data. And as with other countries, uh, we can see from this graph that if you were 65 or over, um, that was the group that were most at risk. Other emerging data also showed that ethnicity was a, was a risk factor as well. Um, and the overall um, risk factor was a relative risk, adjusted relative risk of 1.73. Um, and uh, that has been uh, reflected in other studies. This was a meta-analysis and, and systematic review that was carried out. There was also emerging data in, uh, in uh, cardiological situations and diabetes. This graph shows uh, the, summer, the summary at the bottom of this uh, rather busy table um, uh, shows that uh, hypertension, diabetes, and heart disease were all associated with increasing risk. And in organ failure, we can see those red squares or diamonds that show that there is increasing risk uh, with chronic liver disease, uh, COPD, and with chronic kidney disease. In that time, there were studies going on and uh, the recovery collaborative group were looking at um, uh, the use of uh, dexamethasone. And the results of that study showed that the use of dexamethasone was lots of, resulted in a lower 28 day mortality among those who were receiving invasive mechanical ventilation or some oxygen dependence. And in the second wave, we saw the use of dexamethasone shooting up actually. Remdesivir was also used initially, but was later dropped because the evidence was found to be uh, rather lacking uh, or equivocal at best. And the vaccines we were promised were all in development and we were waiting with bated breath. The second wave, uh, as shown on the graphs there, ran from about se September to April, a very long and chronic um, situation. It was much longer the staff, for the staff it was physically and emotionally exhausting. Um, the numbers were higher for longer, but there was anecdotal evidence that the dexamethasone was making a difference to the death rate of those being admitted. Public health rules had come in like the rule of six, not to gather in groups of more than six indoors or outdoors, uh, encouraging people to work from home and a tier system for how you ran uh, different areas of the country. It wasn't until October um, that lockdown was reintroduced and the prime minister said that was to prevent and, uh, a medical and moral disaster for the NHS. Not surprisingly in this wave, uh, whereas in the first wave, there'd been a lot of goodwill publicly, this wave, there was the voice of skeptics was rising and people were getting rather fed up of the whole situation. That lockdown um, ended after four weeks when we returned to three tier restrictions. And then around that time, uh, the COVID vaccine was granted regulatory approval and the first vaccine was given to a lady called Margaret Keenan on the 8th of December, 2020. The third wave was very different. Again, the vaccination program was in full grow, was it was growing rapidly, and the priority groups were being done, and and we were getting through uh, people being vaccinated. Uh, and then on the nineteenth of uh, July this year, there was a removal uh, of the legal COVID restrictions in England. At that stage, eighty six percent of people over the age of eighteen had had one vaccine, and just about seventy percent had had both vaccines. And uh, since then, we've been living uh, with minimal restrictions. However, other things have crept in, and there has been this phenomenon called the pingdemic. Now, I haven't mentioned much about track and trace, partly because it's never been a system that people really had a lot of faith in. But there has been something uh, running on this front. And when you have had a contact, your phone through the app that you would upload onto your phone gives you a ping. And when that ping arrives, you have then got to isolate and seek attention. This has led to what they call the pingdemic. And it has been estimated that 5 to 10% of workers at any one time 
uh, in healthcare, transport, retailing and manufacturing have had to take time off work. And this has created huge logistical problems for the infrastructure of the country. And uh, not crisis point uh, in terms of food, food delivery, but just noticeable shortages of certain routine items, but never anything particularly dangerous. Here's a graph to just uh, show um, the vaccine uptake in the UK. This is to the end of August, um, and the numbers are slowing and plateauing out at this stage. One of the things we have noticed that has risen has been uh, problems with vaccine hesitancy. And uh, in this study of 12,000 patients, they looked at um, the likelihood of groups taking up the vaccines. And Roughly about one in five said they were unlikely or very unlikely to take up the vaccine. And when they drilled down to see which groups uh, were affected by this, they found it was higher in women, younger age groups, uh, lower educated, and in some of the ethnic minorities. Now the younger group are probably uh, a cause for debate anyway, because their risks are essentially lower than uh, the older, uh, elements of the population. But some of those other ones, uh, rather counterintuitively, uh, such as the ethnic minorities, are at higher risk. And uh, that is a work which the government and public health groups are trying to work on to try and increase the vaccine uptake in that group. The reasons given by these groups were the unknown effects or side effects of the vaccines, or just a simple mistrust of the vaccines. And, um, and I have colleagues who, uh, who, who who believe that too. And this uh, picture in there was uh, something that was sent to me by a friend who um, uh, is a skeptic himself. And these were some of the things that uh, he said, you see at the bottom there it says, get injected with untested vaccine. So that kind of uh, narrative is out there and together with the rise of the skepticism in, in, in the way in way of two, this has gained a, lit a significant but minority traction in some groups. So those are the three waves, and we can see that they are very different. We know that with the vaccinations, the number of hospitalizations has dropped dramatically. But there are a number of unknowns which are creeping in here. Um, I'm going to look at the first two initially. Um, so COVID mortality and number of excess deaths. At this stage, as we'll all know, it's difficult uh, to get accurate numbers on this, and I'm sure you've talked about this uh, earlier today. Uh, but the other thing we've noticed is our, our issues around long COVID. This is a graph of excess deaths um, and comparing it to five year averages. And essentially, uh, they're suggesting that from, the, from this data that the total deaths from all causes were below the five year average in the 25 week period recorded. It's not clear why this is, it's not clear. Um, whether this is going to be maintained. And a lot of uh, the commentators on this suggest that we should be waiting a few years before we make any real pronouncement. So difficult to make sense of this, so I'm not going to say too much more about that. But regarding long COVID, it's a very difficult thing to, to define as far as we can see. Uh, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence has described this as uh, ongoing COVID symptoms for four to 12 weeks, or a post-COVID syndrome for greater than 12 weeks in terms of defining what's going on. The ONS, the Office of National Statistics in the UK, estimated the prevalence of uh, one in five have symptoms beyond five weeks and one in 10 beyond 10 weeks. Again, these are rough figures and difficult to nail down. The National Institute for Health Research have suggested that post-COVID symptoms may consist of several different symptoms. One of the things certainly that came to my attention was the post-intensive care syndrome for those, for those patients who have been in ITU and been ventilated. It's been documented for many years that those patients who have been through that will have post-ITU type syndromes. And whether we are just viewing that and calling that post-COVID is one, one of the theories. Whether this is just another manifestation of chronic fatigue syndrome or a long-term COVID-19 is not, is not known. 
uh, but there are documented cases, and, and there's certainly at least one person I know who has myocarditis who has uh, 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 from COVID, and that is causing uh, significant symptomatic problems six months down the line. Despite this, little is known about um, the predictive factors for this. When you look at the symptoms of long COVID, it is really a very large uh, group of non-specific symptoms. And uh, looking at this meta-analysis or a living systematic review as the authors have called it, we can see that weakness and malaise and fatigue, how those are defined within the studies, uh, I, I'm not gonna go into. Uh, but these kind of rather vague group of symptoms uh, which do have a significant uh, effect on quality of life. Now, there is certainly a need for more research, and that's highlighted in that, but you can see from that, from that picture right there that there are so many different symptoms that it's hard to really disentangle the mechanisms underlying that, and that, is the that is, uh, would be integral for any uh, reasonable or um, meaningful research to happen in this area. In, the, in another review, there is uh, the recommendation for treatment of long COVID are, are laid out here. Again, we're still very much learning on this, rather like we were in the first wave. So we've looked at the first two issues. The other unknowns is really the non-COVID morbidity and mortality um, that fo is following on from changes in healthcare structures and, uh, and the effects on other patients. So, uh, there is a worry about what's going to happen with cancer patients and certainly in palliative care uh, we have anecdotally and certainly in my unit noticed uh, that we seem to be getting younger patients with more advanced disease appearing late and uh, we had more people uh, coming to the hospice who were dying within 24 to 48 hours and that was maybe because they didn't really want to leave home or because of fears around the virus uh, talking to my psychiatric colleagues, it's clear that uh, there is a feeling that the number of suicides has gone up. And these aren't just uh, acute uh, suicidal intent. They, they've really put it down to uh, the fact that chronic people with suicide, chronic people with suicidal ideation are not getting the support that they need to maintain their, their mental state. And so... Uh, one of my colleagues was saying, whereas they would have one suicide a month, on average, he, he, he was having five. And that took a big toll on the staff. The other issue is around infectious diseases. And um, certainly to talk to my pediatrician friends, they've said that uh, uh, in September and August of um, this year, that um, wards are full of respir respiratory syncytial virus, which is normally something that happens in the winter here, so October, November, December. And that is concerning them. And also the other thought is really in the, the issue about influenza and what type of influenza is coming, which one we uh, vaccinate against. The other issue is hospital waiting lists. And certainly the hospital waiting lists pre-pandemic were estimated by the Institute for Fiscal Studies at being 4.4 million. And in May 2021, they've gone up to 5.3 million. The general predictors are that this is going to get worse before it gets better, and that is a real cause for concern uh, within the UK. One of the other questions that we don't know is really, and that we keep asking, is how is the UK done compared to other countries? Um, I think each country at each wave has had its different critics about how they've done things. I know the UK has been uh, lauded really for its vaccination things, its vaccination programme, but. Um, I think the first two waves, there was a lot of critics about whether we should have shut the border or whether we should have done something more like Australia. I think that we were slower than some of the Asian countries because we really hadn't been, um, uh, we didn't really have any uh, frame of reference about what this pandemic was going to do. Whereas uh, in, in Asia and certainly the Middle East, uh, uh, MERS and SARS had both lifted their heads in, in, the, in the early 2000s, which had prepared people and gave people a, the idea of what they needed to do in those circumstances. But the other unknowns are really socially, spiritually, psychologically, bereavement-wise, economically and politically, what this is going to do. It's way beyond the scope of this talk for me to uh, talk about that. So here we have our uh, tale of three waves. So the first wave where we've had um, isolated, we just had selected testing, but uh, 
large peak of deaths, which which um, tailed off quickly, probably because of lockdown, although people can test that. The second wave where widespread testing was starting to uh, take off, and so that the shape of the graph uh, of number of cases and number of deaths uh, reflect each other in shape, although the numbers you can see there are very different. And then the third wave where we see that with vaccinations up and running, and the number of vaccine uptake being uh, up to around 80%, that although the numbers are peaking again in terms of cases, the number of deaths is significantly lower. So what are our conclusions? Well, it's difficult really to have any uh, firm conclusions. However, from the first wave, we can see that the targeted testing and the rapid rapid peaks in deaths was what, what um, uh, we saw on the graph. But it was really marked by uncertainty, fear, and rapid learning about what we needed to do in this situation. And we really were uh, looking back quite on edge about what this all might mean. The second wave was really much wider testing, people being much more aware of what they could and couldn't do, where the cutoffs for care were, uh, people being much more um, afraid with the disease itself. But it was certainly a much more prolonged, uh, it took a big hit on people's confidence and causing more fatigue uh, in staff. I mean, the, the, impl the impact on staff was huge, certainly in our hospital. But then there was also this light at the end of the tunnel with uh, studies coming through with the vaccine. The third wave, really the vaccination rates are, uh, were growing under that wave and seeing a huge change in hospitalizations and death and the, the lifting of restrictions. But then we're left with these unknowns, really, what is going to be the real cost of this pandemic? So thank you very much for um, listening to the talk today. There is my list of references uh, and I will uh, you will no doubt have a handout with this on it but um, thank you very much uh, for listening and I will now appear on the line uh, to uh, answer any questions if people have them. All the best.